Welcome to our conversation on leadership. Uh, I'm Steve Slick. I'm the director of the Intelligence Studies Project here at the University and also a clinical professor at the LBJ School. Let me start by acknowledging and thanking the teams from the Intelligence Studies Project, the Clement Center for National Security, the Strauss Center for International Security, and law for all their hard work that goes into preparing events like this. We also sincerely appreciate our host and partners at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. So by way of notice and warning, I, I suppose, for those of you who may wish to ask questions later in the program, uh, this event will be recorded and it's going to be available as a podcast through the partnership between the Texas National Security Network and the War on the Rocks uh, blog site. So of course, we set high expectations for our students here and our graduates at the University of Texas. We expect our graduates not only to perform well in their public service or private sector jobs, but also to advance, assume broader responsibilities, and ultimately to lead others. And it's not too soon to start preparing for that task. Today we've assembled an extraordinary group of leaders to share their perspectives. So I know you're interested in hearing from our guests and not necessarily about them. So <laughs> since they're already seated up front to make room for more of our students to join, let me just remind you uh, who we have the privilege of hosting today. So across the way is uh, John Brennan, a distinguished non-resident scholar at the university and the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Next to him is Admiral William Craven, our UT System Chancellor, and the former commander of the United States Special Operations Command. All the way closest to me is Admiral Bobby Inman, the LBJ Centennial Chair in National Policy here at the University, former director of the National Security Agency, and the deputy director of Central Intelligence. And to break the National Security Caucus, <laughs> is the Honorable Julian Castro, a Dean's Distinguished Fellow here at the LBJ School, former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and the Mayor of the great city of San Antonio. So, today's conversation will be moderated by our colleague, Professor Will Inbun, who's also the Executive Director of the Clement Center. So, over to you, Will. So, all right, uh, great to see everybody here. Uh, as Steve mentioned, I'm the uh, Executive Director of the Clements Center. I'm also uh, honored to be a professor here at the LBJ School. And I'm also the uh, new Editor-in-Chief of the Texas National Security Review. And I mention that because, as Steve uh, said, we are recording this, and it'll be turned into a podcast uh, for the Texas National Security Review and War on the Rocks. And so uh, listen eagerly. Uh, be mindful of that when, you're, uh, when it's time for your questions as well. Um, we'll be preserving this for posterity and distributing it far uh, across the nation and across the globe. Uh, and finally, by way of preface, I'll say it's such an honor to be with these uh, these four great leaders here. Uh, as a, a little bit of a uh, introductory experiment, I started trying to tabulate the number of people who have been under their direct leadership in some form or another, their, their subjects, if you will, uh, and also tried to tabulate the number of years of decades of combined leadership experience here. But uh, I'm just a historian. There's a lot more than I could count, a lot higher than I could count. Anyway, but let's just say that we are very privileged to have uh, such a range of experiences and wisdom here. Uh, each of our panelists is going to start off with a couple minutes of opening reflections on what, what leadership means, and then I'm going to go through uh, some, uh, some questions here, and we'll want to uh, finally after that the last part of the program here from the, here from the audience. Uh, so first up, uh, Director Brennan, share a couple thoughts on... Well, thank you, Will, and it's great to be back here at the University of Texas. And thinking about leadership, what I believe is one of the, the most essential quality of leadership is a good University of Texas education. <laughs> Uh, but when I think about leadership, I think about those leaders who I most admire and the ones who have been most successful. Um, their leadership is basically the manifestation of the experiences that they had throughout the course of their lives. And they then had the opportunity to demonstrate that leadership by following through with those principles, the guiding star, the North Star as I call it, that uh, leads them in every aspect of their life. I was very fortunate to have a mother and father that taught me early on about the distinction between right and wrong and what it means to be a good person and how to treat others with, with dignity and making sure that uh, I was able to uh, show to others the qualities that I value and those uh, principles that guided me. I'm also a very strong proponent of early childhood development. My, my wife right now is very much involved in 
trying to make sure that uh, the young generation of Americans, including in, where she works in, with the migrant communities, have the opportunity to thrive and to flourish. And those ages between zero and five are so important to be able to instill in these young individuals those traits, those qualities, those values that are going to be very important throughout the course of their lives. So as one goes up through the ranks, and I had the great honor and distinction to be referred to as the director of CIA, not because I was smarter or better than others. I had opportunities that were given to me, people who took time to mentor and coach me, and uh, I was able to then live out sort of my experiences uh, in those leadership positions. So again, I, I think that uh, leaders uh, emerge uh, through the course, certainly of their early lives, and then have the opportunity to uh, live uh, those values, those qualities, uh, and those experiences that uh, are most important in terms of making sure one is a successful and good leader. Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, I, I tell you, you, know, you can't be a military guy, I don't think, without quoting Karl von Clausewitz, who was the, uh, <laughs> the 18th century Russian general who really who wrote a seminal book on war. And there's a great quote in, uh, on war where Clausewitz says, everything in war is easy. It's just the easy things are difficult. <laughs> so everything in war is easy, it's just the easy things are difficult. But I think this is like leadership. You know, when you, when you think of leadership, you know, I could get up on a whiteboard and tell you all the things you need to know about leadership. You know, lead from the front, set the example, do all those sort of things. It's just hard to do. Uh, one of the first questions I'm almost always asked about leadership is, are leader, great leaders born, or can you make great leaders? And I'll tell you what I found in my 37 years in the military is you can absolutely take young men and women and turn them into very, very good leaders. Uh, you do that by instilling in them, again, a sense of values, a sense of integrity, a sense of honor. You teach them how to communicate. Uh, you teach them how to lead in small groups and in larger groups and back to the experience. You have to have these experiences as you grow, but they can absolutely become good leaders. I will offer, however, that I think great leaders, there's got to be something in their DNA that is a little bit different. They have to have all those qualities of the good leaders, but the ones I've seen that are great have, you know, for lack of a better term, kind of an emotional quotient where they can be around a group of men or women, they can be around an audience, they can see things, they can feel things that maybe other people just don't see or feel. And that allows them to interact in a way, I think, that, that even very good leaders sometimes struggle with. So when you think about what can be taught, uh, I mean, the first thing we learn in the military is take care of the troops and the troops will take care of you. I think that's about as simple as it comes when it's when you're thinking about leadership or leader, leading in a, a group of, uh, of anything, again, a small group or a large group. The question then becomes, what does it mean to take care of the troops? I think when I first got to the SEAL teams, there was a sense that you know, the enlisted guys would come up to me and say, hey, sir, you, know, you got to take care of the troops. That means you got to let us off on Friday, you got to make sure you got plenty of beer in the keg, you know, you got to have all that. And you realize very quickly that's, that's not what taking care of the troops is about. In any great organization, the first thing you have to do is, you have to set the standard for excellence. I don't care whether it's a, a football team, an LBJ school, or a, a University of Texas system. You have to set the standards. Then you have to give folks the resources to meet those standards. So sometimes people would tell me, well, you know, I, I set the standards and the expectations, and the folks working for me just weren't able to achieve it. And then you have to ask, but did you give them the resources? Did you give them the money? Did you give them the time? Did you give them the latitude to do the job? Set the expectations, set the standards, give them the resources, and then hold them accountable. If you do those things, then you will be able to lead a great organization. A book I would offer to you, it's an old one, you can have to search it on Amazon or someplace in the, in the dusty archives, uh, written by John Baines called Morale. And, uh, and the book talks about the second Scottish Rifles. And this was a, a, a brigade level organization back around World War I, British, uh, UK, and, um, and they were an abysmal unit. And then all of a sudden, because a new commander came in, set certain standards, held people accountable, they went into World War I and the Battle of Nouveau Chapelle in particular, and were one of the most distinguished units there. And you recognize the value of those little things about setting the standards, making sure you give people the resources to hold them accountable. And the last thing I'll, I'll talk about is, uh, and John mentioned it, um, particularly in today's environment, I, I have an opportunity to talk to the presidents and the, and the faculty and, the, and folks a lot of times, and I tell them, the one thing you have to do as a leader is the right thing. Do the right thing. There's an old quote from the Texas Rangers, 
We did the right thing because it was right. <coughs> Pretty profound, actually. We did the right thing because it was right. In today's environment, do the right thing. If you do the right thing, you will always be able to stand before the long green table and, and address people's concerns. Uh, if you don't do the right thing, you end up like some of the institutions we've seen lately, or you end, like, end up like Enron. I mean, you have to do the right thing. Do it. Do things that are moral, legal, and ethical. Those are the three litmus tests that I have in every decision we make. I think if you do those sort of things, uh, you'll find you're as good a leader as, uh, as you hope you can be. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, and uh, it's good to be here with such a distinguished panel. Um, so, just very briefly, and I know I've shared this story with some of the students, you know, I, I went into public service um, because I got interested in public service after I went away from my home community of San Antonio, and I could compare uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, my brother and I went to Stanford, to the community that I come from. And I saw that in the Bay Area in the early 90s, that place was a lot more innovative and more well-educated, had higher income levels, um, more ready for the future. Uh, in my hometown, it was a place that still felt connected, where you know, the shorthand that I used is if you were in a, a restaurant and you see, sneeze, two or three people would still say, bless you. you know, there's still a sense of connection among folks. And so my interest in going into public service was, how could you create the best of both worlds in a city? You know, Well-educated, ready for the future, had good income and opportunity, but also a place where people still felt a common sense of identity. They still felt connected to each other. And so, um, as, as Director Brennan and Chancellor McRaven have made clear, uh, there are a lot of things that we can talk about when it comes to leadership, but let me just focus on the one that I've paid particular attention to over the years, which is vision. I think especially in the realm of public service and of electoral public service, um, the vision that you have counts. Uh, being able to articulate what you're going to do if people put their trust in you and essentially hire you into that position. Uh, and remember, in public service, if you're an elected official, uh, you don't have a boss except the people that elected you. And so there's nobody there that can literally on that day fire you. Uh, I know sometimes uh, people wish there was a way. <laughs> but that means that you owe, I think, an extra obligation to folks to let them know what your vision is. And I found that, that the most compelling leaders, whether at a company or in public service or a nonprofit, are those that do have a very strong vision for where they want the organization to go. Now, there's a lot more that goes into whether you can actually execute that vision and lead on it. But to me, that's one of the most fascinating uh, aspects of leadership is that vision that you have from the beginning. I have been very privileged 31 years government, maybe, 35 years private sector, pretty broadly across the business world, uh, 27 years now paralleling in the academic world. But fundamental skills of leadership, I learned in my very first job in the Navy, on an aircraft carrier, in combat, 37 enlisted people, in the division doing communications. Uh, lieutenant was a division officer. I was an assistant division officer, given maintain good order and discipline. <laughs> Half of them were older than I was. Um, I got a wonderful coaching mentoring from chief petty officer, from senior enlisted. What I learned, you manage things. You manage paper. You lead people. And to do that, you've got to be interested in them. You've got to know what are their problems? What are their challenges? What are they concerned about? Um, having a 19-year-old who already had two children coming for advice on how to handle his finances. Um, just the whole array. Uh, but the exposure to what are the needs and the concerns 
of those you want to leave. And then echoing them very much. Uh, early on. You gotta know where it is you want to go. And you've got to be able to articulate with some clarity. Where is it you want people to follow you in this process? There is an image that military officers just issue orders. There's some of that, particularly in times of combat when you have to react almost instantaneous. But for the vast bulk of the effort, it's not giving orders, it's leading them. So uh, my first uh, question to our, our panelists here, and I'll want to hear answers from all four of you, uh, concerns the challenge of leading large organizations, uh, whether it's uh, CIA, NSA, SOCOM, HUD, the city of San Antonio. and all of those, you had tens of thousands and some of a, a million people somehow under your, under your leadership. It's impossible for you to actually know all of them. Uh, and of course, you know, as Admiral was saying, you know, part of leadership involves you know, certainly knowing the people in your care. You can't know all of them personally. Uh, how do you lead an organization where you're never going to meet personally uh, most of the people under your leadership? Uh, how, do you, how do you connect with them? Well, I think it's critically important for a leader to be able to communicate on a regular basis with their organization. And there are many different mechanisms to do that. Uh, as you say, you can't meet everybody in your organization. You can meet an awful lot. You can get down in the trenches. You can meet the troops. You can shake their hands. You can listen to them, listen to what their concerns are, elicit from them input. Because no matter who you are, you're not going to be, you know, have a monopoly on the truth or knowledge. And you try to make sure they understand that you are interested in what their concerns are, what their aspirations are, what their vision is for you know, the, the organization. And so I don't believe that you can over-communicate, um, but also to demonstrate that you are not just listening to them, but you're actually absorbing it, and you're going to try to act upon it. It's very important for there to be demonstrations of sort of leadership actions. Uh, and as I couldn't agree more as far as the, the vision thing, as far as making sure that you're going to do things that's for the good of the organization, and no organization is going to be monolithic in terms of their, their views. And frequently there are a lot of uh, dissenting views in terms of what a leader wants to do. But and that's where it's the leader's responsibility to take into account what the institution needs, what the people need, and to you know go forward and recognize that there are going to be headwinds there. But you want to make sure that you do things in a very in a thoughtful way, making sure you do it with uh, appropriate deliberation, but then also be able to explain to people what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. But if a leader is going to stay within the ivory tower with doors closed, uh, there's going to be a distance then, uh, both literally and figuratively, from the, the people. Uh, you need to demonstrate that you are one of them, you, and you have special obligation responsibilities that you're going to carry out, uh, almost uh, irrespective of whether or not there's going to be, you know, uh, headwinds that come forward. I, well, I, uh, Director Brennan's use of the phrase ivory tower makes you a national follow-up. You know, <laughs> how do you leave the ivory tower without being stuck in the ivory tower? Well, you know, I'll go back to uh, Evan Lemon said uh, one of the best lessons he learned was when he was an uh, Air Naval officer. Mine actually even was before that. When I was a midshipman here going through the ROTC program, between your freshman and sophomore year during that summer, you went on what was euphemistically called a cruise. Uh, but, uh, but the intent was, as a budding officer, uh, I went out and was an enlisted man for eight weeks on board a fast freight. And probably the most, uh, you know, the most important lesson I learned from those eight weeks was the decisions the officers made on that ship and the impact and the effect they had on the enlisted guys. So as, as an enlisted midshipman, uh, I was scrubbing the decks, you know, I was down in the boiler room, I'm chipping paint, you're cleaning the, the latrines, the heads, you're doing all the sort of things the enlisted guys do, and you begin to understand this, this thing we call professional distance. And back to John's point, you can't sit in the ivory tower. You have to get out about and amongst the troops to understand the implications of your decision. If that professional distance ever gets too far, if you as a leader are so far removed from the people that you're making decisions for and about, then you're going to make bad decisions. When I was in, in combat in Iraq or Afghanistan, I had to create a battle rhythm. And, and the same thing I have to do here as a chancellor. And that battle rhythm says that I am going to carve out part of my day or my week to ensure that I am engaging with you know, the, the staff, the universities, or in the case of the uh, time in Iraq and Afghanistan, the troops. Once a week, I would go out on a, uh, a visit to the troops somewhere on the battlefield. And to John's point, you, 
you had an opportunity to find out what they were doing, what they were thinking. And I always went with a very small group of people. You know, there's not an entourage. It was generally me plus two people. Um, and you could sit down, have a cup of coffee with them. They would tell you everything that was right and wrong about what you were doing. <laughs> and that's incredibly important because if the troops, whether they are the students, the faculty, the staff, or the real men and women in uniform, if they don't think they can tell you all that is kind of wrong with the organization, then you're never going to be in a position to fix it and to lead it. Uh, and the only way you know that is to get out and about and meet them. Yeah, I agree. Just a very quick story, you know, at HUD. So we had about 8,000 employees and uh, 55 different field offices. And one of those field offices was in Washington, D.C. So just to put an exclamation point on that. We had our headquarters in Washington, D.C. And then we had a field office in Washington, D.C. And so I visited, I made a point to try and go and visit these different field offices. I probably got up to 30 or 40 something of them. And the folks in the DC field office told me that it had been about 15 years since a HUD secretary had visited the Washington DC field office. Um, but so I completely agree with that point of even though, yes, you know, we're in organizations that are larger than your ability to, to perhaps meet every single employee, you can meet a lot of people and should make the effort. The other thing I would say is that I think that the larger the organization, the more important it is that you set that standard of excellence and people know the vision, they know the standard, and that you do things to listen and to empower them in their roles. So they feel like they have ownership of the organization as well, because the bigger the organization, the more spread out folks are, the more you know the, the tendency is to feel like they're adrift and, and that they're not part of it. So you have to do everything that you can to bring them into the fold to listen and to empower as much as possible. And really, you'll recognize some parallel experiences here in all of this. Um, I became the director of the National Security Agency on the 5th of July, 1977. 16,000 people in the home office, 80% civilian, 20% military. And I found very quickly, they were very skilled at bearing the director around like the pharaoh and <laughs> putting him down at the interest, good deal with the outside world, but then we were up and run the agency. So I, I like to wander around. <laughs> so I designated Tuesday afternoon, three hours, they could not schedule it. And I was going to wander around the agency. Oh, I heard frequently what a waste of time that was, losing all the rest of it. I wandered into an organization, G7, and there was a banner on the wall, just in case I might come. Welcome, Vice Admiral Emma. You're the first director to visit G7 since General Canine, the founding. <laughs> um, the other problem I found, I had fairly sizable staff meetings, senior people, and I'd pull forth on things I thought were important. As I wandered around, I would ask questions. And it was very interesting. What I heard back about what I'd said was not what I thought I'd say, <laughs> but what at least I'd intended to say. So I put together a small group of uh, directors and advisors, young people, picked out military and civilian. And their job was to go wander around the agency and come back and just send me memos, what was going on on their version. And then I'd do a once a quarter, uh, fill up the fairly large auditorium, and give them a report card. How, in my view, the agency was doing for half an hour, and then answer questions for half an hour. And I would always make sure that there were at least 50 junior people in that gathering. And then when I would be wondering, I found they'd gone back and given their version of what I said, which again was not always what had been filtered for the sandals. <laughs> Contact, visibility, very important parts of the issue. All right, so my uh, next question, and uh, Admiral Inman, just to tee you up, I'm going to put this one to you first. So we're reversing order here, so Director Brennan, you get plenty of time to wander on this one now. Um, uh, next question has to do with the relationship between leadership and public opinion, uh, especially in this current era we're in of populist passions and social media frenzies on the, on the right and left and across the, across the political spectrum. 
how does a leader stay in touch with his or her constituents or troops or subjects or worst of all, faculty members, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, how do you stay in touch with uh, the people in your leadership uh, while not succumbing too much to uh, some of the some of the maybe less healthy passions and uh, and mob mentalities that can sometimes sometimes develop, especially in this, in this current era. So. Uh, well, the world is changing at an incredibly fast pace, driven by social media. So I'm a little reluctant even in answering your question. I'm not a. I don't consume social media, I don't spend hours uh, tweeting or texting anything else. Uh, this might even be your first podcast. Yes, <laughs> well, no, I podcast for university. Um, I always found great value in direct conversations. You see, you see body movements, you see reactions in the process. I hate talking to an audience where the spotlights are here and the audience is dark because I can't see how people are reacting. Are they confused? Are they turned off? Do they get... now, how do you get any of that on social media in the process? So, so I worry in this leadership uh, situation, there's a vast volume of information flow. Is it accurate? Is it reliable? Is it timely? Now, is it relevant to the problems you have? I'm still struggling with that. Mm -hmm. Secretary yeah, a couple of things. Uh, number one, um, especially for folks that go into um, a public service, elected public service, you have to know what you fundamentally believe. Some of the folks that I've seen get most in trouble in public office have been the folks that don't, at their core, don't fundamentally know what they believe, aren't attached to any core vision or core sense, uh, set of principles. And so, you know, when the moments come around and this is the fashionable way to go or this this way, they're more willing to do that. Um, you know, obviously, some of that goes on in politics all the time, and some of it is is I think more dangerous um, uh, than than other forms of it. Um, but number one, know what you believe. Secondly, having that good mix of information, a balance of information. And I'll just take a granular example. A lot of times um, you'll go out and speak to constituents, for instance, and they'll talk to you about why something is a problem. And you know, you're speaking to folks, hearing their story, and you're completely on their side because it sounds like, yeah, you know, there's an injustice here or something really needs to get done. And then you go back and talk to staff and hear the reasons why something is being done the way that it's being done. Uh, and, you know, let's say 20% uh, of the time you hear that and it's still not a good explanation and you say, you know what, no, we, we have to change this. But a lot of the time you hear that and you understand, okay, even though I may want to change this and we need to work toward that, there's a reason why there's going to have to be a process or that's why things are the way they are. And so we need to come up with a reasonable way to, to change it and not just the knee-jerk kind of reaction. So knowing what you believe and also a balance in the mix of information that you get uh, and having a practice of doing that, always reminding yourself to do it, I think will serve you well. Yeah, I, mean, I certainly I couldn't agree more. You have to kind of know what your, your core fundamentals are, I think, uh, whenever you're in a leadership position. You know, one of the things I've found here, which of course was entirely different than my time in the military, was that everything you say, every word you write, is part of the public record. Um, I learned that the hard way. Um, <laughs> As I wrote emails, all learned that hard way. As I wrote emails, thinking those emails, not really thinking that they were going to be subject to TPIA, uh, the Texas Public Information Act. But what I found in terms of communicating now is, I write all of my key communications. I write, and that's important because I want I don't want a statement to come out from the chancellor. I don't want some. With all due respect to our, our public relations folks who do a great job, I don't want it to be a canned piece of information. So generally once a week I write a blog, or if I'm going to write to the, uh, you know, the large population of Texas alumni, I write it. 
and I want them to hear my words and the way I'm thinking and my passion and, and my potential issues with a particular situation. And that way, there is no doubt in anybody's mind that, okay, this is what McRaven is saying. You may not like it, uh, you may not agree with it, but at least it won't be misconstrued because I have put it down on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, or on social media or on YouTube or whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the problems we run into today uh, is that sometimes people's, you know, people's words get misconstrued. The good thing about today is you can go back and find exactly what somebody said over the last 10 years and you can hold them accountable for that. Um, so I'd rather be leading that by saying, no, you're going to hear exactly from me. And I'm not going to tell you that, well, I heard what that statement said, but to be honest with you, that was my staffer that wrote that statement. No, no. If it's my statement, then it's my statement. And I think you have to communicate that way. And I did make my statement this morning. <laughs> I think I'd be remiss, first of all, to say that the guy sitting next to me is one of the greatest leaders I ever had the privilege to work with. Uh, right now. Uh, he really rose well above the occasion, so that's great. Um, I think it's important for leaders to create an environment where people do feel empowered. Not just empowered to act, but also empowered to speak up. And whether you're talking about the leadership team or the people that you work for, you want to make sure that they uh, understand that you don't want a bunch of sycophants and yes sirs uh, surrounding you. You want individuals who are going to tell you exactly what they think. And you want them to feel confident that they're going to be able to tell you that in a very straightforward way and not be slapped down as a result. And that, that's critically important because if you want to have that that combination of leader and leadership team that's going to be able to work together. I think about something that Bill said. The leaders have to realize that everything they say and they do watched intensively by individuals around them. And they are role models every moment of the day. And so you have to actually live the types of things that you're talking about. Because if you say one thing but do something else, there's a real inconsistency there. And people are going to say, well, he may say or she may say that, but that's not really what they're trying to advocate. Uh, and something very simple that I did when I was at the agency, I was a very strong advocate for a variety of reasons uh, for LGBT rights at CIA. Because for too many years, uh, individuals of that community were um, not treated appropriately. And so my lanyard at CIA was a rainbow lanyard uh, with my agency badge. And I walked throughout the agency with that. And I must tell you, there were so many people who would come up to me and say, thank you for demonstrating your commitment to this cause. So I think there are things that leaders can do on a daily basis that can be simple, but really going to send a very clear signal to people that this is something that you believe in, these are your principles, and you're going to make sure you stand behind them. And yes, we people who will criticize you for it, and that's where public opinion will come in. And my father used to tell me, if you can look yourself in the mirror you know, every day and say, you took the right decisions because you believe that they were the right things to do, that's fine. You'll always have you know, the naysayers and knuckleheads out there, but you have to make sure that you're able to live to your principles because at the end of the day, that's the one that you really need to make sure that you uh, take care of. It's actually a great segue into my uh, my next question, which again, I'm in a reverse order again, put it right back at you, but I, the, I, will, I want to hear from all of our panelists. The relationship between leadership and morality. Uh, is leadership just a skill, or is there a real moral dimension to it? Uh, is, uh, and, and if so, how would you how, how would you unpack that? You've each alluded to this in different ways, but I'd like to hear some, some further reflections. And uh, Director Brennan gave a very uh, thoughtful lecture on this at uh, campus a couple months ago, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll tee you up first. Yeah, I spoke about the ethos of intelligence and the ethics of intelligence, and I think it's critically important because I think there is a morality that we all need to sort of abide by. As I mentioned before, that morality, at least in my life, was instilled in me early on by my parents, by my family, by my early educators. And it was something that I tried to live up to through the course of my life. And it becomes part of your DNA at a very early age. And if you are not living by that morality early on, when you get into the leadership positions, you know, are you going to really be able to then adapt? And so to me, I think it's critically important that, yes, you need to make sure that you adhere to the letter of the law, but also the spirit of the law, as well as, and morality is a subjective term, uh, I realize that, 
But I do think that there is, in, in essence, a distinction between right and wrong. And a lot of times there are difficult policy decisions and you have you know, a variety of you know, bad options. But uh, frequently, when it comes down to some of the decisions that leaders have to make, uh, individual leaders really know what the right thing is to do. It may be hard, it may be difficult, it may be that you're going to be roundly criticized and you're going to be uh, facing some really turbulent waters. But uh, doing the, the right thing at difficult times is really, I think, what distinguishes you know, the, the good leaders from those who, who fail to meet that standard. Yeah, I'm not sure I can add much to that. Um, I mean, I think John's exactly right. The, the examples that you see today, though, where leadership is failing, I would offer is because it was a failure of their kind of moral independence. And, uh, and so I think you can build great organizations that are, that are really a house of cards because they don't have a moral or an ethical foundation. Uh, so you can win national championships, you can win gold medals, you can uh, bring in great donor gifts, you can have a, you know, a great uh, you know, business going. But if there is not a solid foundation under that at the very top and hopefully throughout the culture, eventually it's going to collapse. Mm. And when it collapses, it collapses big. Mm. Um, and, and I think when you go back and look at uh, the organizations that, that we represent here, are there bad people in the organizations? Of course there are. But the culture, certainly in the military and in the intelligence agencies, and I'm sure at HUD as well, and, and was it's about doing things, again, that are moral, legal, and ethical. There was a sense of duty, honor, and country. Now, not everybody adhered to that. But that was the, the gold standard that we, that we strive for. And, uh, and if you can't at least strive for that and do the best you can to live up to that, then your organization will falter at some time, and when it does, uh, Every, it will take everybody with it. Well, yeah, I completely agree that, that ultimately, um, if you don't have that moral anchor, then you're not going to be an effective leader over the long run. But let me just address this in a way that I think also may be relevant, especially to the students and the audience, which is, um, you know, when I first thought about going into politics, one of the things that I wondered, and frankly, one of the things that gave me pause was whether you could go into politics and lead and succeed in it um, and still be yourself at the other end of it. Or whether you would lose who you are because you had to compromise so much. Because I bet that if we asked folks who had gone in the wrong direction, you know, let's say they've been a leader or an organization for 25 years or something and then something happened and they went in the wrong direction, it's, it's usually not just one moment, right? It's people get off track somehow. What I've found so far is that the answer is that you absolutely can stay true to your convictions. Um, and still, of course, when it comes to policy or implementation of things, make the kind of compromises that you're going to have to make because nobody is ever going to get 100% of what they want. Um, when they're leading or even when they're just any part of the organization. But for those of you all that wonder the same thing, you know, can I still be myself? You know, at least my, what I have found is that the answer is that yes, you can be. If you are that person who is honest, who has a core, then you absolutely can remain that. Uh, in politics, in electoral politics, uh, and still come out on the other side. Emily, leadership by example. Uh, be conscious of the fact that you were being observed, where you go, know what you do. And sometimes that speaks louder than the words you say about leadership. I was particularly concerned as I got to my first flag job from the director of naval intelligence about we were going through congressional hearings, allegations of illegal activities everywhere. And to me it was very important to make sure the workforce understood they could do what they needed to do for the country within the law. And where there was ambiguity, I began at that stage going and working with Congress to get laws enacted to do it. That led to the FISA court, which is now going through a flat, a lot of other things. But I found that helping set up the 
post church and plaque committee uh, <coughs> congressional oversight, which sometimes works well, sometimes doesn't work well in the process. But it was a reality. Most of the intelligence work was being done under high levels of classification. Simple reason to protect sources and methods. And so how did you convince the public that you were abiding by the law? And that's why I turned to congressional committees. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work that well. Uh, and I've said the bulk of times when it didn't work well, it wasn't the problem of the agencies. It was because it became a partisan issue uh, on the Hill in the process. Uh, but the lead by example, I cannot overemphasize. <coughs> Grab the opportunity to go take a leadership role, and sometimes on very difficult issues. I shared with John, I tackled the, the uh, whether or not uh, people who had declared that they were homosexual could continue to be employed in the intelligence community. Sat out a wonderful general counsel, walked through what were the government's interests. Once we satisfied those, put in procedure protected, then declared that that was the case. Great support from the Secretary of Defense, from the President, from Senator Goldwater, from Cops and Mike. And when the media got a hold of it and great uproar, it only lasted 24 hours because when Bob Woodward went to see Senator Goldwater, he said he did exactly the right thing in the process. So it was confronting barriers that did not serve the national interest. That is a leadership issue. So next question. Even our greatest leaders, and I'm sitting with four of them here, are human. Uh, of course, to be human means to be foul and means to make the, uh, the occasional mistake. Uh, so any of you want to, uh, and I'm putting this over here, but I just may call on one of you if I don't get a response. Any of you, do you recall any mistakes that you ever made as a leader? How did you address it? How did you, how did you learn from it? I'll volunteer. All right. <laughs> Which, and I'm glad that you asked this question because this is actually, I think, especially in the public sphere of leadership, one of the biggest problems that we have today, which is that we're we're in this time when the ethos is not to admit not to admit a mistake, and you can kind of understand why that is, right? Because you throw it out there, and then you have on whether it's on Twitter or social media, people are only fed one part of the story, and so on and so forth, and so things get uh, misrepresented, but. I think it's important for people to be able to admit when they've made a mistake and that you know, if you have a boss or a co-worker or you're looking at a candidate uh, that, that can't admit that he or she has made a mistake, that you should run in the other direction. So let me give you an example. Um, at HUD, you know, the, the uh, uh, Folks that are in charge of this found that I had violated the Hatch Act, which folks will remember. The Hatch Act says essentially that you can't mix your roles. You know, HUD secretary, and you can go campaign, in this case for Hillary Clinton, but you can't mix those things. So in April of 2016, uh, during the campaign cycle, I'm giving an interview at the HUD facility, and the interview, interviewer asks me about that about the, the campaign, and I answered that I'm supporting Hillary Clinton. Now, I thought that the way that I had answered it was the appropriate way with language to separate the two, but it wasn't. It was insufficient. It was my mistake. And a few weeks later, they brought that to my attention, and I said, you know what? I made a mistake. Yeah, I messed up. And so we're going to do this and this and this, and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to make sure that that doesn't happen again, and that furthermore, everybody in the organization knows how we're going to avoid that, is that you have to own that stuff. Yeah. And I think that when we evaluate uh, leaders, we should evaluate those leaders not just by everything they did right, but when they messed up, what did they learn from that? You know, are they big enough to admit when they messed up, and then can they learn from it? Like all of us in life, right? You messed up. I've found that over time, that I've become a little less uh, bombastic and less judgmental as I've gotten older. Because I recognize that, no, you know, sometimes people do mess up. And what happens 
after the person messes up. Now, you know, as a leader, you probably don't want somebody that messes up all the time, right? <laughs> That's probably not a good leader. But everybody is going to mess up. And I think that we need to get back to a place in our country where our leaders, whether it's the leader of a company or the mayor of the city or the president himself or herself in the future, can admit that and grow from that and people accept that. Can you well, there's so many of them the word stuff. Yeah, I'm having a challenge. I'm going to down to the same point I'm talking about. something Bobby said earlier. When I first became a manager and a leader uh, of the people in the group that I was in, I had one day been a peer within that group and then was elevated to lead it. And there were individuals who were older and more senior than I was. And I didn't have the appropriate, I think, you know, training experience and preparation for that. And so, for my first two weeks, I had become a bit of a overbearing and uh, not a very good leader or manager. And so the group was starting to not fall apart, but it was known that things weren't going well. And my supervisor at the time called me into my office and said, "John, you've changed so much." I said, "Why?" He said, "We we selected you to be of this." branch chief because of the qualities and the traits that you had exhibited. Good teamwork, empathy, being a real team player. Said, now that you have become this leader, you are not doing the same things that really got you to where you were. And so, and I took a, you know, a very honest look at myself and I was making mistakes. Um, and so what I, I did was I sat down with each one of the individuals in the group and said, I screwed up. You know, I, I really need to understand you know, how to be a better leader. And I want your thoughts on what it is that you are looking to be for. And it was a, a quite an eye-opening experience for me. Um, and one that I'm glad I experienced early on. Because that experience, as painful as it was for me and for them, um, I think it was something that had better prepared me for the subsequent opportunities to, to lead people in the future. Yeah, I always tell folks that uh, you know, if you're in charge of an organization, you have to own that organization's failure. Not just your failure, but the organization's failure. Because you're in charge of the organization. Uh, I want to give kind of three quick examples. You know, if you recall back when we had the BP oil spill off in the Gulf, uh, you know, you had these horrific scenes of oil spread out throughout the entire Gulf. You know, birds covered in oil, small mom and pop fishing stores were devastated by the oil. And at one point in time, a, a, a reporter went to the CEO of BP, and this has been going on for a couple of weeks now, and, uh, and he said, uh, you, know, well, you know, what are you thinking right now? And the CEO of BP said, I just want to get back to my life. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to get back to my life. Uh, he was supposed to be going on vacation, and unfortunately he couldn't make the vacation. Uh, needless to say, he was fired very quick. Uh, right, rightfully so. And so we got back to that life. And got back to that life. <laughs> but uh, another quick example, I was uh, giving some remarks to an international bank uh, one time. And before I had gone in to, uh, to do these remarks, I had gone on the bank's website. And on the bank's website, uh, a cookie popped up. And the cookie was, you know, whoever didn't particularly care for this bank was, you know, it was prominently displayed on their website. <laughs> and it happened to be this guy, Jason. And Jason was saying, you know, I, this bank is okay, but every time I call, nobody picks up the phone. I go into the local bank, and they don't treat me very well. And then he just ripped the bank apart. So there were 600 of these uh, very senior members of this international bank. And I said, and the CEO was sitting down front. And I said, so what would y'all have done in this situation? And about three or four guys raised their hand, and at kind of point, he goes, oh, we take down the website. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's not exactly the answer I was looking for. Uh, I said, well, let me tell you, if I was the CEO, I'd find out who Jason was, and I would call Jason and say, what do I need to do to make this right by you? And they said, why would you do, you're the CEO, you don't have time to call Jason. And my point was, then you don't understand what it takes to be a CEO, because that's exactly what you need to do. You've got to take care of your, you know, your customers, your employees, your staff, your faculty, because you own the problem as a CEO. Now let me fast forward because back to what everybody said here, you know, I've got more mistakes than I can line up, but a, but a couple of them that were very painful 
uh, we had a very serious civilian, civilian casualty incident in Afghanistan. Uh, some of my forces went in inadvertently, not, not inadvertently, but got into a firefight and ended up killing a couple of uh, Afghan policemen uh, that were the sons of one of the village elders. And it was a, just a horrific uh, incident, and it was in a very uh, sporty part of Afghanistan. And I realized that, uh, you know, this was easy for me. I was three levels above this, uh, the decision makers that had kind of gone in to do this, but, but I own this organization. So I went down to meet with the father of the two, um, of his two sons that had been killed, and came into this Afghan village, and it was me and, and one other officer, and, uh, and needless to say, they were not happy. And about 200 came into this little town hall meeting, and I apologized to the father, and I explained to him the actions that we'd taken and where we'd gone wrong. Now, I didn't know how the father was going to take it. Um, and to his credit, uh, he accepted my apology. Um, but, but what came of that was that all of a sudden the fact that an Amer senior American officer had come down to apologize for such an egregious you know, act in the middle of a war zone meant a lot to the Afghans. And all of a sudden, that little part of that province began to change. And so the unintended consequence, I didn't go down there assuming that would happen, but I went down there understanding that this is my responsibility. This is on me. Somehow I failed to either train the guys or teach the guys, uh, or a decision wasn't made at the right level that caused this civilian casualty to occur. I own that. And so I would tell you, Wherever you are in the organization, if you have people below you, this is not about, well, look, I'm sorry, this guy screwed up or this woman screwed up, you know, kind of, no, no, you own that. You're the person in charge. Tom triggered me for one that's, I think it's a teachable moment. Um, I became director of naval intelligence, suddenly had 3,600 people reporting to me, six different organizations. Korean War just ended. How do you get the organization reoriented, focused on a whole new set of problems? Um, I got into a process where, uh, as I was leaving the whatever national day in the evening, the office would load up two or three briefcases, take them over, put them in the safe in the basement of my quarters. Between four and six in the morning, I worked through uh, all that paper, they'd pick up the briefcases at six. Time I got the office at seven, everybody was already at work. What's wrong with that? People stopped making decisions. They would get something put in the briefcase. It was easier, I was gonna make the decision and they might not be held responsible. More than that, I realized I had 25 direct reports in that process. The lesson here is, learn to delegate. It was for me the hardest single thing I had to learn to do as a manager. I could do it faster uh, in the process, but it was terrible for the organization and the process. I got something picked up, promoted, moved elsewhere, and one of my closest friends took over. He was massacred. Spanish control was much too large. It took a long time to turn around this centralized process of decision making. All right, so I'm going to put just one more question to each of our panelists, and these are going to be specific to their own uh, past and backgrounds, and then after that we're going to be taking questions from the audience. So, uh, And I'll say right now, our, our first question from the audience is going to be from a student, so students be thinking about what you want to ask. Uh, Director Brennan, a question for you. Um, during your time as uh, CIA Director, you uh, designed and uh, launched a major modernization campaign. And for all of CIA's accomplishments, it's a very traditional and a, you know change-resistant organization. So how did you lead the workforce through that modernization uh, while still keeping them focused, uh, while making sure that they were uh, you know, carrying out the mission, staying the same mission focused, but eventually buying into uh, to the big major organization? In fact, I spoke to a class here uh, this morning about this issue. I felt a special obligation having the opportunity to be director of CIA after having spent 25 years there previously that I needed to do what I could in order to prepare the agency for the challenges of the future. And 
when we reorganized the agency, it wasn't because the past organization did not serve the agency well. It's just that the environment uh, and the global stage had changed significantly that we needed to do some things, I thought, in a, in a more integrated manner. Uh, there was a lot of uh, concern, a lot of opposition within the organization to that. Uh, and I had to explain to people uh, over and over again what I was trying to do. People were asking me what was broken that I was trying to fix. I said, that's the wrong question. What we need to do is be able to adapt to the changing environment so that we're staying sort of ahead of the, of the curve. Uh, and there were you know, many pockets of opposition. There was, uh, in some respects, an active insurgency within the agency to try to undermine it. Uh, but I think the more and more I was able to communicate it, the more I was able to explain the reasons for it, the more I was able to get very well-respected individuals within the agency to be part of this effort and to be part of this crusade, more people were willing to give it a chance to succeed. And so, uh, thankfully, um, the, that reorganization has endured through the change of administration. Uh, I do think integration of capabilities within the CIA, the IC, within the national security environment is critical. As good as CIA is, or as good as an individual component is, you need to be able to empower one another with that integrated approach. So it was some tough you know, sailing, and uh, some of the toughest opposition was from the Congress because they thought that I had the audacity as the CIA director and the CEO to actually make organizational changes within the agency. You know, so that is the primary responsibility of an executive. You know, maybe it's the vision thing a little bit as well, and to lead the organization into the future and not just rest on the walls of the past. As you said, it is quite notable that uh, Director Pompeo has preserved the, the Brennan model of Pentagon Planning, so... Uh, yes, uh, not the Brennan model. So. <laughs> 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 okay. right. George Marshall didn't want the Marshall Plan named after him. <laughs> uh, uh, Chancellor McRaven, uh, it's universally known that uh, you, uh, in leading JSOC, you led the uh, planning and execution of Operation Neptune Spear, the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. What's much less widely known is that uh, at the same time, simultaneously uh, doing that, that you were also overseeing many other uh, still secret operations by JSOC in all sorts of corners of the globe. How did you lead JSOC through that when everyone knows that, you know, obviously the main priority is, is Neptune's sphere and that you can't let any of these other other, other balls drop? Yeah, you know, I'll go back to what Evelyn had said uh, just a few months ago. I mean, this was about delegating um, responsibility. I mean, ultimately I had the authority, but, but in terms of responsibility to these great uh, group of colonels that I had, uh, the regimental commander uh, from Delta Force, the SEAL commander, uh, the Army Special Forces commander. I mean, these were incredibly seasoned uh, combat veterans that understood how to take the fight to the enemy. So, uh, I mean, the day, as John well knows, the day of the Bin Laden raid, we had 12 missions going in Afghanistan at the time and a number going in Iraq, and all of that was, uh, was orchestrated through, again, the support of the commanders. Um, but, but I tell you, understanding that, uh, that delegation, and providing um, uh, the latitude to the folks below you to do their job, is exactly what I hope I brought here to the role of the Chancellor. Um, you know, when I was a SOCOM commander, the Special Operations Commander, I had 12 what we referred to as subordinate commanders. So the Army Special Operations Command was a three star, the Joint Special Operations Command was a three star, I had two stars, I had a couple of one stars. Well, here it's the same thing. I mean, the flagship, you know, the flagship university here at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, you know, they are the the flagship. You have to give somebody like Greg Finvitz the latitude to do the job, uh, the authority to make the decisions. Uh, he is the CEO of, uh, of the flagship institution. Allow him to make the organizational change that need, need to be made. Uh, but again, hold all of your uh, presidents, your commanders accountable. Make sure you have a strategic plan and a vision for how the entire organization is going forward. But at the end of the day, this is about trusting the people that work for you because you have had an opportunity to spend time with them, to understand how they do business, to recognize that they're going to adhere to the standards you've set, let them go out and do business. So, Secretary Castro, when you uh, took over at HUD as, as Secretary, the, uh, the immediate crisis of the financial crisis and the, and the housing crisis were past, but so many of the residual effects we were still dealing with disproportionately hitting low-income Americans. So how did you come in and, and tackle that problem as, as leader of HUD, even though the, uh, the, the many lost, lost homes and default mortgages weren't in the headlines anymore, those were still lived realities for so many Americans and under, and under, your, under your responsibility? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. You know, I came in um, in late July of 2014 
And of course, the nation had just been through this tremendous housing crisis, and a lot of the folks that we served at HUD and through FHA uh, had been impacted by it. Um, but we also, by that time, had seen that the housing market had started to turn around to get better, get stronger. There were still definitely soft spots across the nation, but it was it was in a lot better shape than it was before. And so one of the things, two thoughts, one of the things I wanted to do was to shift the narrative. Um, a couple months after I, I took office, for instance, um, I said that we needed to uh, end the stigma of promoting home ownership. Because when I came in, if you just said the word home ownership, people were so shell-shocked by what had happened that everybody is, is just associated home ownership with something negative, with the, the economy falling apart. And you know, home ownership has been a bedrock sort of, uh, of the American dream. And so I said that we just need a strong balance to, to take the lessons that we learned um, and the measures that we put in place to ensure that we don't slide backward, but we now need to focus again on reasonably offering um, uh, the opportunity for folks to become homeowners and so forth. The second thing was that my vision for HUD was that of the millions of people that we serve, that we would ensure um, that paths to opportunity orbited around that. Whether it was folks uh, who were living in a public housing community or seniors living in a, a senior complex, uh, that all of the things that they would need to succeed, whether it was uh, health care opportunities, educational opportunities, job training opportunities, that we would partner with others to have those things orbit around them. And the best example of that was Connect Home <coughs> launch, which was a new project under me, uh, working with internet service providers and nonprofits in 28 different communities. We launched this effort to get folks connected to broadband because the vast majority of people that live in public housing don't have access to the internet. And, and that was very much in keeping with that vision. <laughs> All right, and we'll end with that last question for you before we turn to the audience. Uh, when you took over as NSA director and then a, a few years later you became de deputy director of CIA, both of those were still in the uh, fairly immediate aftermath of the Church and Pike Committees, uh, many investigations, and a severe loss of public trust in the intelligence community. Uh, at the same time, we still had a very acute threat from the Soviet Union um, and many other uh, secondary threats uh, facing our country. So how did you restore morale uh, in the IC workforce uh, and still keep them mission, mission focused, uh, even if, as they felt the rest of the country losing so much trust and confidence in them? I'll try not to make this too long way to kind of answer. First, uh, clear rules and authorities. Executive Order 1105, 12, 033, 12, 333, through three successive administrations, not changed much, but laying out legally what you were, could do, what you were expected to do in the process. Then get actual laws, FISA court, uh, the ability to prosecute people who threaten to expose secrets if you prosecute them for their crimes in the process. Um, resources. Uh, here I was very fortunate uh, in the last job. Mr. Casey wanted to run CIA, and he therefore delegated to the deputy, doing the community, doing the budgets, doing the resources. I had just gotten started, and I was sort of figuring how I was going to tackle this. And I got a call, the director was in New Zealand, I got a call, the president wanted to see me. Shooting down to the White House. There's Frank Carlucci, my predecessor, who's now Deputy Secretary of Defense. Rushed in, President Convivial Greeting. This, this is President Reagan. President Reagan, Convivial Greeting. And then said, uh, uh, Admiral, the, Bill Casey tells me you're going to be handling the resources. Rebuild the intelligence community. <laughs> spend whatever you need to spend. Frank, you find the place to put it in the defense budget. So, that pretty good instruction. <laughs> <laughs> Went back. I know a lot of teams who would love to get that answer to you. <laughs> so we a team of people, laid out a five-year plan, yeah. discovered how much the drawdown had shrunk the training establishment, and all the absolute limits of how many people you could train, bring on, a whole variety of things. 
put what you can buy. Finished it, went back down to report, finished the job. Jeff Baker was chief staff. He said, remember the president doesn't like a lot of detail. <laughs> so I go in to report this president he completed because he said, did you get everything you wanted? I said, well, there were real constraints. Things. And he turned to uh, Frank and said, uh, did you give him everything he asked for? <laughs> and he said, yes, Mr. President. And he turned to me and said, well, you're going to tackle those things that were that end of conversation. <laughs> Now, with that kind of broad support and guidance, you can do incredible things. And if you think back, all of, us, of going through each of the layers of the bureaucracy to get an agreement, and then the fights were coming. It was a unique time for rebuilding, and it did last more than about four years. Uh, we're going to turn out questions from the uh, from, from the audience. We have a couple. Uh, we have a student first. We have a couple of mics. Uh, mics floating around. So, um, we have, all right. So, uh, Alex, right there. And please uh, introduce yourself, especially for the for our speakers and for the podcast. Hi there. My name is Alex Vermuchin. I'm an undergraduate fellow at the Clement Center. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute honor to have you here and to listen to all of your amazing advice. Um, Speaking as a student, as a college senior, I think it's going to be quite a few years before I'll be in a position to head up an organization, but um, I wanted to know what specific advice you would have, uh, you would offer to someone in their 20s and still pursuing their education, of what skills we can cultivate now so that one day we are able to honorably lead and serve as you gentlemen have done, in addition to <coughs> making your bed in the morning. <laughs> like a great question, like a particular one. Oral and communications, oral and writing communication skills. Mm -hmm. Critically important to whatever you're going to go do. You build knowledge in specific areas on it, but if you can't communicate it effectively and swiftly, you're going to have limited impact on what you can do. Yeah, I, I was, that's usually what I tell folks also. Uh, you know, it's, it's the way that you communicate with people. That's how most folks are going to at least initially judge you, and they're going to continue to judge you. And um, at least I've been amazed over the years at people's uh, writing ability, and not in a good way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but seriously, I mean, investing the time to become a good writer and communicator. Um, and then also, I think, as you ask for folks in, in their 20s, I found, because I went into public service when I was 26, that being young is a real asset because folks that do have a lot more experience are, you know, they see in you, you know, the future and somebody that's aspirational and has uh, wonderful potential and they want to give you their, their advice. Uh, and so take advantage of that in terms of, you know, don't be shy about seeking out the, the perspective of folks who are leading organizations or have had relevant experience to what you want to go into. And you'll find most of the time that people uh, people want to, to give to us. You know, I was uh, obviously as a journalism major, that was going to be my answer that uh, everyone had have because, you know, frankly, I found those skills that I learned here at the University of Texas, uh, the writing skills, the oral skills, to be one of the most important skill sets that I took in the military. Um, one of the other things I'd offer you, and this uh, advice will probably not be well received, certainly not by my wife who was sitting in the second row, but uh, as I often tell my kids, and I'm asked a lot of times, how do you balance, you know, work and family? And the answer is, you don't. I mean, the fact of the matter is, to succeed, you have to work hard. You have to work harder than everybody else. That's how you succeed. It's a simple formula. It's just hard to do. So as you're trying to balance, you know, work and life, um, I, I would be willing to bet those of us sitting here on the stage would tell you uh, the most difficult thing to do, but to be successful, something has to give. That doesn't mean you can't take care of your life. We've been, we'll be married here 40 years in May. So, um, so the fact of the matter is, it can be done. Uh, but also, you know, you've got to recognize to get ahead, you've got to work very, very hard. I'll, I'll, one other piece is, you need to know your business. Uh, when I first became a SEAL, uh, there was a, a Navy lieutenant who had been lieutenant junior grade, pretty junior, in Vietnam. But this lieutenant, John Wright, uh, knew more about weapons, demolition, diving, SEAL tactics. I mean, he seemed to be an expert in everything that had to do with being a SEAL. 
And I learned very quickly that to be a good leader, you have to know your business. One of the reasons John Brennan was such an exceptional director of CIA is 25 years in the agency. Knew everything about the agency. Sometimes, you know, we put people into agencies because they may have great leadership skills, but, you know, you really do have to understand the depth of the business that you're going into. So whatever you decide to go into, work hard and know your business. Just to say, like Bill, I didn't get the work-life balance right in the course of my professional career. When I look back on it, I had some real serious regrets there because I, I didn't, uh, uh, I think, uh, fulfill some of my personal responsibilities that I should have on the home front because of the, the, the drive of, of work. But I'll be married 40 years. Uh, yeah. even Six. Though I, Six. <laughs> even though Valentine's Day yesterday I was in El Paso. So. <laughs> That's over. But one of the other things is learning to deal with all types of situations in a professional and uh, even keeled manner. Both uh, Bill and I were just talking in the elevator that we were reading the uh, Ron Chernoff book on Mrs. Grant. And someone who demonstrated tremendous you know, calmness uh, and temperament in terms of even dealing with crises. And that's where I think the leaders really are tested. And when Bill was leading the uh, Neptune Spear operation, and uh, we were in constant contact with him uh, from the White House uh, as that was going on. And when that first helicopter um, pulled down and hit the wall, you know, Bill didn't say, oh my God, what are we going to do? <laughs> very, very calmly, and just went to the next, okay, so, and they prepared for, you know, plan B and the contingency plans there. But he demonstrated a calmness and a confidence that just really helped everybody who was working for him, as well as the people in the White House, including the President, that we had somebody there who was able to deal with this type of situation in the most competent and professional manner. Uh, so as you go through your normal day lives, just trying to think about how you're going to deal with some of these issues uh, from that, uh, that standpoint. Well, can I? I know you've got questions to go, but check. Across the four of us, we all are problem solvers. Develop along the way. It's something we're drawn to. We see a problem, we go solve it in the process. And I think that's an essential thing to, to think that uh, you've got so many problems. How do you solve them? Approach it when you to find solutions. Another question. Uh, yes, right here. Uh, Kelsey, you can bring my comment. And again, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Casey Boyles. I'm a Strauss Fellow and a graduate student here at UT. My question is about the um, politically appointed dimension of leadership in, in Washington and in many places. How do you navigate uh, moving between uh, the civilian leadership and the politically appointed dimensions of leadership? Uh, do you, does your leadership approach change? Or are there unique challenges that arise from moving into these types of roles? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question, and one of my uh, what something that was different for me, and actually something that I didn't particularly care for in the role, um, was that uh, you know when you're in public service and you're an elected official, you're basically uh, are speaking for yourself, right? Um, in one of those appointed positions, like a lot of other jobs, um, you're not. And so that was one of the transitions that I had to get used to, um, was to understand that you're part of a sort of common agenda, and it's really, the, it's not your White House, it's Barack Obama's White House, and it's the messaging fundamentally that they want. And yeah, obviously I agree with what we're doing 99% of the time. But it was a 1% that you know, sometimes can get frustrating. Um, but I think that, uh, like anything else, I mean, if you signed up for that, you were signing up knowing what, what that dynamic would be. And um, that means that you have to be especially uh, you know, thoughtful before you take on a role like that and make sure that the folks that you're serving are people that you believe in and that you, you're, you're with the program, you know? Because in those positions, you, you're not fully your own person, so to speak. Um, you're part of somebody else's administration. Secretary Castro was part of the cabinet and part of the policy apparatus. 
we within the intelligence community and the military are separate from that. And we are not part of that policy effort. We maintain an independence and a, an objectivity and trying to be as apolitical and nonpartisan as possible. That's why I think it's very important for the appointees, uh, whether they be uniform officers or the heads of the intelligence agencies, to be able to make sure they're able to speak truth to power and not to get involved in the politics and the politicization that is ongoing in Washington. Mm -hmm. When I was director of CIA, I proposed legislation to the White House that the director of CIA should be a term appointment, like five years of whatever, taking it out of that political cycle. Because the FBI director has a 10-year term, and foolishly, I thought that that was going to protect the individuals in those positions. So, <laughs> was you know, uh, not worthwhile to pursue the legislation. Uh, but I, I do think it's important that there is a solemn obligation on the part of intelligence officials and military officers to be able to maintain that independence and uh, non-political uh, perspective and, uh, and stance. In taking promotions and taking those offices, we pledge allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, not to individuals along the way. And that's what we have to always do. Shane Walsh, I'm just a local businessman. Uh, my question regards. And a uh, former Marine. <laughs> no, uh, Army officer. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate the compliment. Okay. <laughs> So my question is uh, with regard to leadership, specifically in the legislative branch um, at the federal level. Um, and so, uh, sir, I agree with your comment that I think the essence of leadership is just doing the right thing. Um, because I think at that point, other people just naturally want to follow you. The leadership that you have to display as a legislator is different than when you're, because you just have a very small staff of people, so that doing the right thing becomes larger. But it's an interesting job, I think, that a legislator has, because as an elected official, you're charged with doing what your constituents want you to do and also doing the right thing. And sometimes those are not the same thing. <laughs> and I think that there is a lot of the first and maybe not so much of the second uh, going on at the federal level in some cases um, on, on both sides of the aisle. And so, and, and I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I ask this as a, I just would love to know your thoughts on that constant struggle between the need to do what you're elected to do, what your constituents want you to do, the need to do the right thing, and then how you apply leadership to that challenge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My brother's a communist. Um, yeah. <laughs> Where do I start here? I mean, you're right. Some of my, my least favorite moments when I was uh, Hunt Secretary were um, you know, appearing before the House Financial Services Committee um, because 80% of that is theater. You don't have seen that. I mean, you get folks that haven't even read the stuff, don't really know the policy, most of them, some of them do. You know, and their staff gives them the questions to ask, and then they put on their TV voice you know, to grill you about X, Y, or Z. And you know that a whole bunch of that is fake. And as somebody that had been in politics before, you know, I can, especially that was frustrating. And at the same time, um, I can't blame it all on them. And I say that because um, you know there's redistricting and they pack a whole bunch of folks that believe the same thing, but also you know, I all, I believe that 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 the voters and the populace have a role to play in holding folks accountable. And the fact is that we all I think are falling short in that regard. Okay. And so they're falling short. A lot of them. Uh, and you, you have folks, as you said, that they know what they should be doing. They know what the right thing and the reasonable thing is, but they're playing to the crowd. Mm -hmm. But there's also the crowd, the matter of the crowd itself. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes to the need to improve that representation, but also the need to improve where we are as a society and 
you know, that's a that's a long term kind of endeavor. And Emma McRaven talked earlier about working hard. And this applies to the legislative arena as well. But I had the privilege of working with them weekly, certain often daily, for eight and a half years. They went to work Monday morning. They broke off Friday afternoon. There were events all weekend, social events, crossing the aisles with the families involved. Look at it now. They go to work Tuesday morning. They go back to the district Thursday evening. There is almost no social interaction. Most of the families don't live in Washington. Definitions of cost, how expensive it's become to run a campaign. So they need to be back in the district to raise money. Those simple differences in work span and approach to doing the job has dramatically driven this shift toward partisanship on one side and on the other. You don't get the budgets done and other things on time. So you could change this whole process by going back to work rooms. Maybe you need to lower the cost of campaign, shorten them along the way. But if you want a much more functional legislative body, it's going to be shift the work rules back to where they're there five days in a row, they're circulating on weekends, and then they take a week to go back to the district. Free advice. <laughs> I probably don't need the mic. No, well, no, for the oh, you, oh, for the thing. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Put your ego back in um, the pocket. You all talked about. Uh, and oh, it's sorry. 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 I'm, I'm new at this. My name is Jason oh. Thomas. I'm a second year LBJ student. Um, I have a question about professional distance and closing that gap. When you are going through the spaces at Langley, Tampa, City Hall, or Fort Meade, and you're talking to the troops, that's one thing. But those overzealous middle managers, those chief petty officers, who want to maintain their control and their fiefdoms. How do you identify them? How do you mitigate that? And how do you keep those lines of communication open? Yeah, uh, the, uh, again, it gets back to uh, you know, this, this issue of, kind of professional distance, but maintain the contact. So one of the reasons, or a number of reasons I went out, and you know, I tried to go out every week on a mission uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan. And I did that for a number of reasons. One, uh, you know, as a leader, you really do have to share the hardships. You have to share the dangers or the troops think that you're just sitting in your ivory tower drinking coffee. Um, but another part of this, uh, you know, back to what Secretary Castro said about the vision, and, and Admiral Inman said about, you know, you would say something and you wondered whether it was getting down to the right level. So part of this is, how is what you said, or what you directed, or what you ordered, being implemented down at the lowest possible level? And the only way you find that out is to get out in the field, to get in other offices, to, to go see for yourself. That's where you have an opportunity to engage with those mid-level managers who, said, who say, well, what I thought the admiral said was this. <laughs> and back to one of my earlier comments about when I write something, I write it. No, this is what I said. And that way, you, know, you can look at that middle manager and say, let me make sure you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Do this, don't do this, and, and get their feedback as well. So again, I, this does come, come back to having contact with whatever that population might be in terms of middle managers to make sure they are relaying your intent uh, down to the level that, that they supervise. I found that unannounced visits were really yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> and I would just wander out of my office if I had a gap in my schedule, and which would just frustrate my secretary and security. Where are you going? Don't worry, I'm okay. <laughs> and I would wander into offices and just you know go and talk to people. And I remember one time, somebody was over their desk who just really concentrated and said, how are you doing? Without looking up, he said, fine. <laughs> I said, if things going well? He goes, yeah, it is. And, and we were coming in a conversation like that for you know, about a minute or two. Or whatever. He never looked up. And then he looked up, and he's just went, ah. <laughs> and he told me some things you know, in terms of the need for you know, more support or whatever else. But I think it's critically important. And let that word get out. And it circulated. And so people would hear, well, you were down in this division. You were over there. You know, and I even did it on some of the outbuildings in Washington. It's hard to do an unannounced visit overseas, but, but I do think it's important to have that opportunity and also let people know and to say, because I had town halls, I said, listen, if you want to bring something to my attention because you don't think it's being addressed appropriately, my email address 
send it to me, or, or, send, send, or, or give me a call, or whatever. And letting them know that you are available and accessible, and people don't have to go through all different you know, uh, obstacles. Yeah, as I say, getting that sense from, from folks all the way down uh, the, the, the chain of the organization on how um, you know, supervisors and managers are doing, getting that feedback yourself and then being able to address that with them. Um, but also, I mean, there's a push and pull here because a lot of times in organizations, the problem is that people don't want to make a decision, <laughs> especially with bureaucracies. I can't tell you how many times that was a complaint that we got. And so the, the, the balance that you have to strike is how do you empower them enough so that they feel like you know they have their own, uh, they do have their own set of responsibilities and authorities and their own persona, for lack of a better word, in the organization. But, but uh, at the same time, they, they are uh, implementing the vision and living up to the standard that has been set. I think that is the, the trick. And getting that feedback from the folks that they're supervising is part of the best way. Building off my other colleagues here, um, privilege to celebrate the 60th wedding anniversary next year. And looking back over those 60 years, um, my wife took on pretty early the self-appointed role of being my chief critic. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I tell about her wonderful acceptance of my work habits, and once I could afford it, I supported her spending habits. <laughs> but the reality was, uh, all along the way, uh, there'd be a lot of applause at the end of the speech. And she said, you want your best. <laughs> Keeping the ego in check is the great contribution, I think, to the long-term successes. Well, and again, we must be thinking way too much alike, Apple and Apple. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, this is one of the things I was going to recommend to, frankly, everybody that wants to be a leader, is you have to have that partner that gets you through the tough moments. I mean, I think back on all my failures, and it was my wife that picked me up and said, you'll be all right. You know, pat you on the back, dust you off, says, you're better than this, keep moving. There were times when I wanted to quit, she said, don't quit, you've never quit at anything in your life. And if you don't have that as a leader, uh, it's tough to get through those tough times. And so figure out who that partner is, whether it's your spouse, whether it's a great friend, whoever that happens to be, you're gonna need that person. You're going to need that person to get you to wherever you hope to go. Um, and again, I was fortunate to have uh, George Ann by my side through all of the last uh, 40 years. All right, well, please join me in a warm round of applause for this.